it's been a shocking week, really, hasn't it? The 24th of February, Russia marched into the Ukraine and the onslaught began. And many of us are concerned for friends, for loved ones, for our fellow Christians, for all human beings who are going through a struggle at the moment. And there's a worry as well, isn't there, that maybe it will get bigger. What will happen tomorrow? If we turn to scripture, Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7, say this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. These words are true. They're hard to hold on to sometimes. And sometimes when we rejoice, we feel guilty that we're ignoring the plight of others. But we rejoice in the fact that God loves us, that God will triumph, whatever happens. And maybe our hopeful expectations have been dashed on this rocks of war. But that does not mean that triumph will not be seen. So today I want us to begin by rejoicing in our Lord, rejoicing in he who has seen so many things in our past and sees so many things in our future. And then we will go on to sing, who is like you? Who is like our saviour? And then once we have remembered who it is that we worship, remembered who it is that we have hope in, then we will pray. So we begin with our friends from Emu Music singing Rejoice. See 
carried up the hill. He has walked this path before us. He is walking with us still, turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice when you cry to Him. He hears your voice. He will.
Who can fathom love that ransoms, pays the debt to give us freedom? Ha, freedom. We we'll come to a time where we're going to um, pray for the Ukraine at first and then for others. But I've just realised that I haven't even said good morning. It's been that kind of a week, really, that my mind has been on the needs of others and I haven't even said good morning. So good morning to you all. And can I just remind you that though we will be praying in a moment together, that you can put any prayer requests in the chat, in the comments boxes, and we will pray. And the people watching with you right now or people watching later, will pray for you too, for those concerns that you have. So let's come together, let's pray together, firstly for the Ukraine and our brothers and sisters there, and then um, for others. And any print that is in yellow, I ask that you would pray with me. So let's begin. Father God, King of all nations, we cry out to you now for the people of Ukraine. We ask you to rescue those who are vulnerable from the hands of their enemies, that they may live without fear before you all their days. And so we pray together. Kiri eleison. Lord, have mercy. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Lord of Lords and Prince of Peace, politicians are predicting the biggest war in Europe since 1945. And we simply cry out to you urgently to write another story in our time thwart the dark machinations of evil men. Give wisdom beyond human wisdom to peacemakers seeking an equitable and less violent way. May politicians exercise the wisdom from above, which is peaceable, gentle, willing to yield and full of mercy. Kiri eleison. Lord, have mercy. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Holy Spirit, we pray for the church in Ukraine, a nation in which 70% of the population call themselves Christian. Give our many brothers and sisters in that nation courage in this crisis, that they may proclaim the good news of your kingdom, bind up broken hearts and bring comfort to all who mourn. Kiri eleison, Lord, have mercy. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. You make wars. You, Lord, make wars cease to the end of the earth. You break bows, shatter spears, and burn shields with fire. And so we ask you now to save the lives of many people in Ukraine. Make a peace that is strong and not weak. De-escalate this crisis. We hear of wars and rumors of wars, 
but you, Lord, are our rock, our fortress and our deliverer. Our hope is in you. And so we address the nations now. In the name of Jesus, we say, be still and know God. He is exalted among the nations. He shall be exalted in the earth. Kiri Eleison, Lord, have mercy. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Lord, as we continue to pray for others, we bring our loved ones and all their needs. And so we pray together. Kiri Eleison, Lord, have mercy. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. We bring you, the church here online, Lord, the church in Peterborough, in this nation and in this world. Kiri Eleison, Lord have mercy. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. We bring you, Lord, all in government, local, national and international. Kiri Eleison, Lord have mercy. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. We bring to those who do not know peace of mind, body or spirit, those who find themselves in a wilderness place today. Kiri Eleison. Lord, have mercy. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. We bring you ourselves, just as we are, acknowledging your love for us as we reach out to you. Kiri Eleison, Lord have mercy. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, 
have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Lord of all, we graciously thank you for hearing the concerns of our hearts and minds and trust you to answer our prayers in the way that best fits each situation and person that we have brought before you. Amen, Lord Jesus. Amen. And so, folks, I want to thank the team at 24-7 Prayer who wrote that first bit of the prayers that we prayed for Ukraine. I thank them uh, for enabling us to pray today. So let's remember all as we continue to pray, but in song this time, as we sing together, beauty for brokenness. Let's pray. I think that's such a beautiful song. And I pray that God will fan into flame those, those feelings of compassion that will move us to action. 
and there are so many people I am glad to say who are trying with every part of them to make a difference to people in need you know talking about people it's amazing how many people come together to make this happen so um we have the people who write and perform the songs. We have the people in the background right now who are listening to uh, and, and reading your prayers, who are putting up different bits and pieces of, for you um, on the chat. The people that are keeping an eye on what's going on and trying to make sure that nothing falls down. And I especially thank them because they do an incredible job. There's the people who, like I say, write the prayers. There's the people who put all of this together and make sure that it goes out on um youtube and out on facebook so that we can join together at this time and at different times when we can get together there's the people who pray for the services there are people who in the background our prayer warriors who pray for all of the preachers and for all of the services that happen in this circuit. So it's not just the people that you see. There are so many people behind this that make things happen. And of course, there's the people who do our readings. And today we've got Leslie and Heather from Yaxley uh, Chapel and they have taken the time to send in a recording of them sharing scripture with us because of course scripture needs to be heard as well as read. Now it's the first week or rather the first Sunday of Lent so we're going to hear passages like we do at Christmas that we hear very often. And we're going to hear the um, story about Jesus in the wilderness. We're going to hear Paul talking about salvation and what we believe. But today, let's, let's ask God to actually refresh these words of scripture for us because sometimes I don't know about you but I kind of go oh yeah I know that I don't you don't none of us do God in his incredible grace opens up so many things to us and we suddenly see a new nuance that we hadn't seen before because our eyes were more closed than they are so let's pray and then we'll hand over to Leslie and to Heather as they bring us our passages from scripture from Luke and for, from Romans Holy Spirit we thank you we thank you for all of the people that come together to make worship happen to enable us to lift up our hearts to you to consider your word. And so we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here with us. And we pray that you will open up scripture to us today in a new way, in a way that refreshes us and a way that leads us further into your kingdom, further into doing your will, further into your peace and into your freedom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I said, let's hand over to Leslie and to Heather now. I'm reading from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Jesus is tested in the wilderness. 
Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him to a high place and showed him in the instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it's written, He will command his angels concerning you, to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered. He said, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an appropriate time. I'm reading from Romans chapter 10, verses 8b through to 13. The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That means the word we are preaching, you must put your faith in. Say with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. With your heart you believe and are made right with God. With your mouth you say that Jesus is Lord, and so you are saved. Scripture says, the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. There is no difference between those who are Jews and those who are not. The same Lord is Lord of all. He richly blesses everyone who calls on him. Scripture says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Thank you, ladies. So, when Jesus goes into the desert for 40 days and nights, he comes face to face with the tempter, who asks him three questions. Each question challenges Jesus to prove his identity by using the power that comes with the identity in a self-serving way. As we enter the period of Lent, we, like Jesus, are invited to reflect on questions of identity. Who and whose are we? And how we, do we live authentically? So our passage from Romans 10 gives us the chance to think about these questions a little. Paul suggests that we are a people to whom the word has come near, who have heard the word proclaimed, a people who have believed that word. And it's something we may not think about very often, but maybe we should ask some more questions. In what way does the word draw near to us? Maybe it's as a spoken word, maybe as a written word, maybe a visual image of some kind, maybe through ritual, a tradition in church, or an action undertaken by another person that we witness, that we see. We are 
people's living Bibles. Or maybe the word draws near us in the person of Jesus himself. And what makes us receptive to that word that Paul talks about? The word that we've heard and believed. Well, he says in verses 9 and 10 that he wants us to look in a different way, to have our emphasis not just on who are we through what we hear and how we encounter the word of God, but who are we when we put into action that word that we have heard and believed? How do we live out what we've heard and live that identity authentically? Paul's saying that our lives should echo our beliefs. The beliefs of our hearts should be echoed in the words that we speak, especially as we confess or witness to the word of God made flesh. So how does having confidence that God has raised Jesus from the dead shape the way we live? And what are the different ways that we confess? And what is it that we're confessing? In fact, are we witnessing at all? Are we saying and living what we believe? How do we demonstrate that we have entrusted our whole being to God, that the words of his mouth that created the world dwell in our hearts and enable us to live. How do we demonstrate that we have entrusted ourselves to God? Well, I suppose one of the ways that we can do this is by trusting the Holy Spirit to guide us, which very neatly, thank you very much, brings, uh, brings us to Jesus in the wilderness. So our gospel reading reminds us of the power of following the Spirit. Question I've always wondered, though, is why would the Spirit fill Jesus and then lead him into the wilderness? But then in looking deeper into Scripture, it's not really that surprising. In other passages, we see the Spirit filling people and then leading them into what we would call trials and uncertainties and wildernesses. Take Luke 1. John the Baptist in the womb of his mother is filled with the Holy Spirit. But by Luke 3, John is in the wilderness baptizing people, calling them to live authentic lives and criticizing Roman tax collectors, military personnel and Herod himself. And now this same spirit of God that filled John, that overshadowed Mary, and I suppose took her into a wilderness of accusation a virgin mother. This same spirit descends on Jesus, leading him into the wilderness.
The good news is that by the time Jesus leaves the wilderness and returns to Galilee, he's not just led by the Spirit, but he's full of the power of the Spirit. Now, I want us to remember that he is a man like any other. Philippians reminds us that he gave up everything to serve. In Jesus' exchange with the devil, we pick up hints and clues on how he makes his way through the wilderness with true power. And it shows us how to live that authentic life that I've been asking about. Each of the three trials that the devil presents raises a question about power, about Jesus' power, about the devil's own power, and ultimately God's, Father God's power. In the first of the three trials, Jesus is goaded. If you're the son of God and asked to transform a stone into bread, so the devil's taking advantage of Jesus' hunger and provokes Jesus to summon that divine authority for his own personal cravings. And when we think about that time, that's what the emperors like Augustus or Tiberius mentioned earlier in Luke would have done. They claimed to be the son of God too. And this claim granted them authority and access to anything. Whatever they desired, they got. They could demand grain from Egypt or taxes from their provinces by using their military might. Their words could carry power of life or death over any of their subjects. But Jesus is not that kind of self-serving son of God. Jesus responds saying that person's life is more than their cravings. And quoting Deuteronomy, he emphasizes that humans are not solely responsible for their own well-being. He's saying people should lean into the Spirit's leading, even in uncertain circumstances, maybe even especially in uncertain circumstances, but always is more right. He's saying that we should learn from the Israelites who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. During those times in the desert, their lack, <laughs> didn't hinder God's faithful provision at all. And he gave them manna that nourished them for the whole time that they were in the desert. And the spirit, like a pillar of cloud and fire, leads us to God's gracious provision. Jesus' power is rooted in confidently following the spirit, even into the unknown of the wilderness. And as followers of Jesus, our power should be rooted in following God's spirit too, in learning that even in the midst of the desert, we too can be fed. In the second of the trials, 
The devil claims that he, yes, he, can give Jesus authority and fame over the kingdoms of the inhabited world. Okay, maybe we need to make that a bit smaller. Another way to think of inhabited world is probably to think Roman Empire. Jesus is offered prestige within this empire. Remember, it's an empire that John the Baptist is criticizing while he's encouraging people to follow God. All the devil's saying, all he's asking, not much, is that Jesus worship him. The devil's exaggerating his power here. He's saying that he has the power to give everything that Jesus can see to him. But Jesus calls his bluff. And he states that the Lord is the only one to be worshipped. He's saying that the power that the devil and the Roman Empire think that they have is limited. Their fame, their authority are not the priorities that Jesus has because he's answering to a higher authority. Jesus recognises that attaining fame if, if that requires becoming a servant of the devil, if pursuing prestige means ignoring the eternal creator of all, then that cost is too high. And there is no price on Jesus' loyalty or love of his father. I wonder if there is a price on ours. How often do we get distracted by wanting to be seen, wanting to be acknowledged, rather than humbly walking with our God? It's one of those things that is struggle I think for many of us especially as we're encouraged to say by my efforts I did this is there a price on our loyalty to God in the third trial the devil quotes passages from the Psalms now, maybe this is a response to Jesus quoting from the Bible when he counters the devil's earlier schemes. I don't know. And he weaves together two psalms to convince Jesus to throw himself down from the highest point of the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus counters him again, again with a passage from Deuteronomy. And it's a passage that recalls a time when the Lord provided water from a rock. But he provided for complaining Israelites. For people who had actually angered him when they questioned, is God among us or not? Come on, God, prove you're here. And so the devil attempts to get Jesus to put God on trial too. And what's Jesus' response? Well, his response suggests that we should not use scripture to cast doubt on God's presence with his people. That's for one. God's scripture should not be used for a game of gotcha. I mean, how many times after this is Jesus going to be questioned by Pharisees and Sadducees trying to catch him out? Nor should 
scripture be used and recited to serve our selfish interests either. Instead, our scripture, the scripture that's given to us, that's God breathed. Scripture is a reminder of God's powerful presence with us, his people, even when we're in the wilderness. And there, through scripture, the spirit leads us to resist the allures of the devil, the temptations, the come with me's of empire and false power. So who are we? We are a people led by and empowered by God's spirit who guides us in the times when we lie beside still waters and in the times when we struggle through the wilderness. We are a people who follow Jesus and confess that he is Lord. We're a people who, over the next 40 days, will explore our weaknesses and find that he is made strong when we lean into his power and humble ourselves rather than trying to take control of everything. We are a people who are not self-seeking or empire builders, like we see on the news lately. But we are a people who say, let your will be done. Let your kingdom come here on earth as in heaven. Who say, lead me, Lord, guide me. And as we say in the covenant prayer every year, let me be put to what you will. So I think it is fitting for us to stop for a moment to think about whether in this desert of ours we are being asked to use power in a way that it shouldn't be. We are being asked to ask ourselves questions in the time of Lent. Who am I and whose am I? And do I love power and control more than God? Like I said, we are a people who say, let your will be done, Lord. Let your kingdom come. So let's pray the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught. So let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Now and forever. And so we continue as we sing 
asking our God of grace and our God of glory for the wisdom and courage to face the temptations of this world. So let us sing together. Jesus confessed what he believed when he quoted scripture. Paul says that we believe and we speak, we confess that Jesus is Lord. We have the Nicene Creed, we have the Apostles' Creed, we have many creeds that we say. And I wonder if Maybe today, as we face the wilderness of the things that are going on around us at the moment, we too need to find words to share what it is that we believe. Now, I'm going to read a creed to you. It's slightly different, and maybe it's one that will help you to find a way to express what you believe. So, a slightly different creed from normal, but I pray that it will help you to confess your faith too. I'll begin. I believe in God, three in one, Father, Son, Spirit, Paradox, Mystery, Elemental. I believe in a God of justice, compassion, mercy, hope, and first, a God of love. Love personified, incarnated. I believe in God the mother of creation, God, the father of humanity, God, the lover of us all. I believe we were called to activity out of passivity and apathy by the son of God through his actions, calling down through history, born, on the wings of the spirit. I believe we are called to community with each other through Christ, the thread weaving us all together. I believe that God plays no favorites, pulls no punches, leaves no stone unturned. 
I believe that life is hard. I believe that life is beautiful. So I believe does God. We thank Matt Patterson for those words. And we've asked for wisdom to face the world. We've asked for courage from our God of grace and glory. We have heard the profession of faith and profess that faith as we have worshipped today. So let us turn now to our guide and ask that he who was hungry would be our bread of heaven and feed us evermore. So we have come to the end of our service and I thank you for travelling with me in this time of worship. And whatever wilderness the Spirit has brought you to or may bring you to, I pray that you will walk in boldness as a beloved child of God. I pray that you will walk in peace under the shelter of the Most High. And most of all, I pray that you will walk in faith, knowing that Christ walks with you. Go from here today. Break any bonds of apathy or fear through by leaning in to the spirit of Jesus himself. God bless you all. We will pray if you've put anything in the comments box and have an incredible day, whether it be beside still waters or in the midst of the wilderness. Know that God is with you. Amen.